Father, we thank you right now in Jesus' name that you are breaking chains, changing lives, and drawing us closer than we've ever been before. Lord, we thank you for a personal revival in our homes, of our kids and our families, all of our relatives and friends, and, and especially all of our enemies, Lord. We call them into the kingdom in Jesus' name. You know, when you learn to be in tune to the Holy Spirit, the next step is to be obedient to that. My question is, throw it at you in this moment, are you being obedient to all that he's telling you? Just throwing it out there. I don't know your life, but are you being obedient? I know some areas in my life, like I'm like, yeah, I kind of got to work on that one. You know, where none of us are perfect. Lord, we just release your peace right now. See, the peace of God crushes Satan. It's, it's not like this little, oh, oh, it's just peace. No, you don't understand. Peace has power. It's why we do all the bad things we do is because we're trying to find it. But the peace of God, when it comes, it crushes everything that's not God. We just release that right now in the name of Jesus. To everyone watching, everyone listening, we just release your peace in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Mm. God is so good, isn't he? <laughs> the Lord's been speaking to me for right at a week about about some things that's on his heart for you guys. So, before we get into that, I just want to talk to you about the offering for just a minute. There's a scripture that resounds in my heart above all else, all the time, and it's when Paul talks about the Macedonians. Okay? The, the scripture says the Macedonians gave out of their poverty. Okay? Basically, they were starving people given to starving people. Paul was talking to the Corinthians when he told him that. You may not know much about the Corinthian church, but the Corinthian church was perhaps kind of the America of the time. They had all kinds of cool innovations. They, they, could, they, they had a way to take boats across land during certain times of the year when they couldn't sail around because of the weather. You know, these guys, they had a lot of money in the city. Now, I'm not going to say one of the Corinthian church was rich, but the Corinthian church, he said to them, you have like all the spiritual gifts. Like you guys are balling when it comes to spiritual gifts. Now, they had sin and stuff in their church, but one of the other things they lacked in was giving. The Macedonian church gave more than they did. They gave out of the poverty. I mean, they didn't just literally give more because of, of comparison, like they had nothing and the Corinthians had everything. It's because they literally gave more. Because they weren't giving to get. They weren't trying to get rich. They weren't trying to walk in the blessing of God. They just saw a need. They, they, because they loved God, when they saw the need, they're like, hey, we have something to give. You know? Now, we are supposed to give our tithes and offerings, and that's powerful. But sometimes you just need to check your heart, you know, when it comes to giving. Because, unfortunately, church as, as a body in America has tainted people's hearts. So when the preacher comes up and talks about money, everybody gets all offended, you know. And it's just because, because the, they were harassing the sheep. And, and we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that with you guys here in this house. Like, we ask you guys, like, hey, live given to the Lord. And you guys are like, yeah, heck yeah, I'm going to help somebody out, you know. I'm not telling you something new, but I just want to encourage your heart that when you give into the kingdom, when you give into this house, it's given into the Lord's hands, you know, and it makes a difference. It makes an impact. You know, maybe you can't give what you did give, but give, you know, I heard a preacher, preacher one time say, bless God. If I don't have nothing else, I'll give a pencil. You know, I just thought that was funny. But the point he was making was that, you know, you do what you can, you know, so if the ushers would get ready and uh, we're going to take up an offering. This is going to change people's lives. I mean, it really does. It changes. I mean, you see, some of you guys are the changed ones sitting in this house right now, you know, literally. 
Like if it wouldn't be for this church, how many of you think that you would be serving God right now? How many of you are serving God now because of this house? Yeah, I know I am. You know, so some of you gave into your own future and didn't even know it. You gave into other people's future. There's people who may not be here anymore who gave into your future. You know, so you guys can go ahead and pass the offering. Thank you for being faithful. Faithful in coming, faithful in giving. It's, it's powerful. So today, one of the things that, that Jesus was speaking to me before I start here was he looked off at a crowd, and the Bible says that when Jesus saw the crowd, he could see that they were harassed and helpless, okay? He said they're like sheep, they're harassed and helpless, and what he meant by that was, you know, when, when, when the wolves come after the sheep, they harass them, they attack them from the backside, cause them to, to scatter, Right? And so in our lives, sometimes we allow busyness, we allow anxiety, we allow fear, we allow the burdens of life, we allow the pleasures of life to harass us to the point where we begin to scatter away from Him. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the good part, the good portion. And it's important that you get this because the thing is, is that one of the things that's a killer to revival, one of the things that's a killer to the fire of God in your heart is having the cares of the world all over you. And the cares of the world are not just the stress and anxiety, it's also the pleasures. I've known people who when they really need to hear a word from God, they went on a, on a, on a vacation. I'm not saying you shouldn't go on vacations. I'm just saying that they counted their, the, the, what they wanted more when they needed something else. They're like, I need a vacation. Like, no, you need to be at the altar. And I, look, I am not against vacations. Trust me, I have one coming up soon. <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is that we have to be careful. We have to guard our hearts, that we're not allowing the pleasures of the world. I would say that one of the key areas, one of the areas is things like Facebook, Instagram. Those things are pleasures of the world, right? They've proven that it releases all the chemicals in your brain to make you like it, make you know, feel happy or whatnot. But that can distract you from the voice of God in your life. Not to mention it can add anxiety. You start reading all the stuff happening on there. This person's mad and that person's mad. You know, it's like, geez, you know. Like, I, if a phone, phone could be a bomb, you could just throw that sucker and just blow people up, man. Them, those things, they're dangerous, right. you know? If I did it all over again, I told my kids this, I wouldn't let my kids have cell phones. Like, not until they're like 16 or 17. I just wouldn't do it. And if they did, they wouldn't have access to the Internet. You know, I didn't know all that I knew now. I, I just didn't. Thank God, thank God, I did not, they did not have cell phones when I was a kid. Praise the Lord, you know? My internet experience was harassing other Christians on, on um, those chat rooms, you know. I'd be like, is God real? And they'd be like, he, you know, I know all the right questions to ask, you know. I know all the answers too, you know. And they'd be all like getting on me and attacking like, you know, you need, let me tell you about this Jesus, you know. Anyways, I, call me whatever you want. But that was like the worst thing, you know. Anyways, so I want to talk to you today about the good part. So if you read in Luke 8 verses 4 through 15, it talks about the parable of the sower. Okay, now some of you know the story, some of you don't, so I'm just going to hit the highlights of the sower, okay? So Jesus talked about there was a person who was sowing seed. Back in the day, they'd have a pouch, and they just cast seed. Nowadays, we professionally plant every single seed individually. We have machines that can poke a hole and plant the seed all at the same time. But, but back then, they just cast it wherever. And some of the seed fell on the pathway. And I'm not going to get into the whole teaching on this, but that's kind of that's the, all the things that the world says, Right? Things you hear on Facebook, things you hear on YouTube. That's all the things the world says. Some people like to gather all the information from all the people, from all the religions, from all the faiths. If that's going to be you, you're, you're going to hear the word of God and it's going to be stolen from you. If you're trying to find truth, it's going to be stolen from you. You will, ne you will come and sit in this house in the fire of God and you will walk out with nothing. You've got to shut your ears to the mouths of all the other stuff. The next thing he talked about was some of the, some of the seed fell on the stony ground. And he said this seed would pop up and it would grow really fast. You know, that Christian's like, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. But then we see that it faded away because it had no root. The Bible says when the time of testing came, it failed. See, the thing is, is 
all of us are going to be tested. Because the testing of God is not like, let's see how bad they fell. The testing of God is, is purifying you to prepare you for the next step. And every time you get tested, see, that's why you can't use your circumstance to show whether or not you're living God, right for God. Oh, financially, we're having problems. It doesn't mean that your life's all wrong. You know, I, I, I mean, people have said that, you know, like, hey, look at that person over there. They must really love God. They're blessed. They have all this money. But I'm going to tell you something. Let me take that person and put him in your situation and see if they still live for God. <laughs> you know, maybe they couldn't even handle it. That's why they're where they're at. But I'm going to tell you something. You've got to learn how to walk through that testing. Because and it might be testing with your health. It might, and I'm not saying God's putting sickness on you. I'm saying that when the sickness comes, you, you are being tested. Are you going to trust God through that? You know, are you going to trust God when the job isn't working out or when the money's not coming in? Because we all pray good. We got a million dollars. Man, we pray good. But man, you, let me take it away and you're looking at foreclosure on your house. What are you praying then? <laughs> are, you, are you yelling at God? Are you cursing God? Are you coming with a pitiful prayer? Oh God, more porridge, please. You know? How are you? How are, that, because that shows your level of faith. I've been there. I remember praying in my shop that I just made, not the new one I have now, but an older one. And I just finally got me a little shop. It was tiny. It was really insignificant. It was like the ugliest shop ever known to man. But it was mine. And I had my little torn up Bible. That was my shop Bible because, you know, that was, And I had it in there. And I walked in there and realized that I could lose all this because it had been several months before we had paid on our house because we couldn't, you know. And, and that's when I realized that it didn't matter that I had him. It didn't, it didn't matter. All those problems didn't matter because I had God. Because, and, and so that changed me to, to a whole different level. And it wasn't long after that God took care of all that stuff. And it was, of course, it wasn't just one problem. It was the government all of a sudden now needs $1,500 because I didn't file something right. But thank God, God blessed me and it ended up being $150. You know? But when it was the $1,500, I wasn't feeling all flowery and praisey and glorified God. I mean, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know? So, during, when, when he talks about the parable, the next one he says, he talks about, and then he casts some seed, and it fell in the thorns. And we're going to kind of stick, pun intended, into that little category there. Because this is what he said about the, about the thorns. And he said in Luke 8, 8, 8, 14, And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Now notice that it says the cares, the, the stress, the anxiety, and the riches and the pleasures. Okay? So it's, it's, it's all of it. It's all of your life can be a distraction to you if you're not careful. And so the reason this is important is we, we want to talk about Luke 10:38 through 42. And it says this. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into their house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feast and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted by much serving, so she went up, up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. I should have thought she just tell Jesus, tell her to help me, Jesus, tell her now. Anyways, like I'd be like, please, <laughs> you know, anyways. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which should not be taken away from her. The good portion will not be taken away. But let's talk about Mary for a minute. I mean, Martha for a minute, because we've all been there. Okay, this is not a teaching on a servant and a person who worships. Okay, because a worshiper serves. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just saying, it's, you know, it's part, of, it's part of what we do. But the problem was her heart. It was what was in her heart. So here's the thing. Um, if you look up the word anxious, basically it means anxious. We don't have to be all confusing about that. But to help us understand it better, the English definition is experiencing worry or typically about an event or something uh, with an uncertain outcome. Right? So we're worrying, we're stressing about something that hadn't even happened yet. Okay? Our heart's on it. But then let's talk about the word troubled. Now that's, that's our fun word there. So when you talk about the word troubled, um, it's, it's one, of the, one of the meanings to it is this. It's, it's called... Um, where, where do we put it at? Tebed. Okay? And the word, the word tebed means this. It's a turban. I'm sorry, turban. 
the word turban or tur- turbid, sorry, means this: cloudy, opaque, thick, suspended matter, muddy, full of confusion. Okay. Now that might not be a word that you're familiar with. I wasn't either a long time ago when I first looked this up. And I'm like, what the heck is that word? You know. And so when you look it up and you begin to to read about it, what it means is is basically water with like particles and stuff in it, like like fluid with suspended stuff. So they test they test water. Uh, by how much light can pass through it, okay? And so I think it's called a turbinity test or something to that effect. And, and they, they send light through this and see if light goes through. And however much light comes through means that's how pure it is of, of, of at least particles and things floating in it. So she was troubled. In a manner of speaking, she was muddied on the inside. Like imagine a jar with water and the, the sediment set, and then you take that jar and you shake it. What happens? It fills with stuff. It clutters. No longer can light shine through it. See, the problem is, is when we allow the cares of the world and stuff to, to begin to, to cloud us, even if it's the cares of other people, even if it's the cares about what's happening to the government, whatever that is, when those things begin to take place in us, it clouds us, and the light of God quits shining through us because we're full. That's the difference of Mary and Martha. Because Martha inside had put things in, in the wrong priority, and it was clouding her and, and concerning her. And the thing is, is that most of the people in this house are hard workers, okay? So it's, it, there's, there's like a fine line, like how, how do I not work hard? How do I not concentrate? How do I not think about the things that I need to think about with my job or with my career or with my family? How do I not think about those things? But see, there's a place of knowing they're there, but having the peace of God that he will take you through it. But Martha, she was troubled on the inside. She was anxious. She, was, she, was, she had suspended particles. She had muddied up on the inside so that she couldn't hear the portion that Jesus was doing. Mary ran over there. She, was just, she just saw Jesus and she just sat down. She had duties too. She had things she needed to take care of too. Sometimes in life, you just have to let go of things that are important, which means they're not going to get done. Yes, it means there'll be consequences, but sometimes you just have to let it go. Everything is not always going to work out. You know, you may not make it to Walmart at the end of the day. Okay, but you have to learn how to find that good portion. Because if you don't learn how to switch that, switch that on in an instant to be sensitive to the Spirit of God, you're going to miss some of the most important moments of your life. I cannot tell you how many times that I missed, I missed God when I knew it was Him because I was being logical or I was being thorough or I was being responsible. Okay? See, when it comes to God, sometimes we could take our responsibility and put that in front of God. Okay? And there is always a balance and there is a moment, but I'm just saying there are moments. Like when it's time for altar, like it's a moment. Like just shut up and come. When it's time for church, sometimes you just need to come. I don't feel like it. all this stuff's going wrong. Everybody hates me. Whatever, just come. Because you might find that those are the moments when God really needs to speak to you. I've told you this probably before, but years ago when we were in the, uh, the building over by Walmart, I just had a, man, it was just a rough day. And, and um, something had happened, and it had nothing to do with Pastor Kyle, just so you know. And, but something had happened, and it just really upset me. And I was a little bit offended. I was a little bit frustrated, and I was just ready to walk out. Not to leave the church, just that day. And we had a prophet came and was speaking. And I was like, you know, every time I know somebody that something like this happens to, there was something they needed to hear there. So I went, took my little angry butt all the way to the front row, sat down. And like three seconds after I sat down, boom, it, I got a word right then. God knew that I had something there, but so did Satan. You know, sometimes he tries to distract you with emotions. And emotions, I'm not going to say they always lie, but they're not dependable. You have to depend and know that what God says is the truth. We want to see God's fire and revival move in this church. We want to see God's miracles happen and people being saved. But do you think that Satan wants any of that? So he's going to distract you with as much as he can distract you with. He's going to busy you as much as he can busy you with so that you miss that moment to be a part of what's happening in this house. 
I mean, I know I've been there. Don't, don't think there's been times when like, and, and this dumb stuff, like something happened to work, man, I got to work a little later. And then I work later and got nothing accomplished and missed like this great moment at church or missed something that God was doing here. And I'm not saying God's all mad at me. I'm just saying that I wanted to experience that. And I'm like, dead gum, that was a lie of the devil, you know, because I thought if I worked a little longer, if I worked a little harder, this would happen and none of it worked out, you know? So, um, but Mary had a troubled heart. So in Matthew 12, 34, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But another version says, out of the overflow. And I like using the word overflow because it helps us see like, like water flowing out of our hearts, flowing and ebbing out of our life. And so a long time ago, I learned how to drill water wells. Pretty sure I couldn't do it now. But one of the things we had to do when the water well was drilling, so when, when you're drilling a water well, at least the ones we did, and it goes down to the ground, water's being shoved down there. And the water that's being shoved down there was pushing sediment up. And you would stick your hand down in this little trough you made and get pieces of the sediment, and you would write down notes that however many feet you were, you found clay, you found sand, you found rock, you know. And that's, that was an overflow of the water. And that's how I picture our hearts. It's out of our heart is flowing water. But in the process, there's sediment, there's particles, there's things that are muddied up that's coming out. And whenever you get pressed really hard, all that stuff, boom, it's like shaking up a jar. What should come out is clean, pure water, right? That's what's supposed to come out of us when life hits hard. But a lot of times it doesn't. And so, and then we just beat ourselves up, which is just doing the opposite of cleaning, our, cleaning out our fountain, cleaning out what God has inside of us. Okay, so the, the trick is this, is learning how to be sensitive and want to be in, his, in, in that special moment, that portion like, like what Mary had. She didn't care if she was perfect. She didn't care if she had it all right. She didn't care if she had all the food set that we're supposed to. She didn't even care if her sister was going to be mad at her. She just sat down and partook of what Jesus was giving in the moment. Okay? Now, I'm not saying if you're in the middle of rescuing some of a fire and you're a firefighter that you just like, I'm going to rest in the moment of God right now and someone's burning and they're like, no. You know, like, but, but that's not the case most of the time. I'm talking about when you go into your office or you go into your room or your prayer closet and you're going to pray and all of a sudden you're like, you see something like, oh, I need to clean that up. And then the phone rings. That's what I'm talking about. When you have your time with God, you got to learn how to shut all that stuff out and have that moment with Jesus. Because unlike back then, they had to find him or he found them, but now he lives in our hearts. And so he's always ever present and he's always ready to teach. You cannot come and get the word of God without getting taught something if you are even halfway sensitive to God. He will speak to you. Well, he hadn't done anything yet. Read longer. Because there's something in there for you. So in Proverbs 4.23, it says this, Keep your heart with all uh, vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Watch your heart and guard your heart what you put in there. Because, yeah, of course there's things that are sinful and bad you definitely shouldn't be watching. Okay? But let's just get past that for the moment because I think you should know that one. But you can also watch stuff that causes you stress. What's happening in the world, what's happening around. Because we're wanting to change lives in this house. And you don't change lives by worrying about what's happening around you. Jesus didn't care about the Roman government taking over. He could care less about that. All he cared about was forming disciples so those disciples could form disciples. In the midst of a government being overturned, Okay, and God forbid it ever happened here, but in the midst of a government being overturned by another government, in the midst of oppression from another country, they flourished in the house of God, serving God, not worrying themselves of the cares of the world. They participated, they had to go get food, they had to, they had to live, they had to have jobs, they had to deal with the occupation of the Romans. But guess what? In the midst of that, and even being chased from building to building because they were Christians, they just served God and partook of the good portion and did what Jesus did and made more disciples and made more disciples and made more disciples. So what's our life supposed to be about as Christians? Sometimes in the Christian church, it's real easy, you know, just to get fat and happy. Like, let me get more of God. Let me get more of God. Let me get more of God. How about we get more people? I'm referring to bringing them in the church, not, you know, filling your head with the world. But we need to reach out. You carry in your heart a spark of God that burns brighter than you can ever imagine. And what you do is you make the mistake and look in the mirror and you see a piece of junk instead of seeing the glory of God. 
The Bible says he's called us from glory to glory to glory. What does that mean? That means that if you just give him any time of the day, if you will just give him a little bit of your day every day, then you will go and you will go deeper and deeper from glory to glory. But you don't get that when you're busy looking at yourself instead of his reflection. Because if you just look at you, yeah, yeah, you ain't all right. But the Bible says we're seated with him in heavenly places. And you can either live from the seat that you're sitting in now, or you can live from the seat that you're sitting with him up there. There's a difference. The Bible says that we're more than conquerors. Okay? You don't, you don't be more than a conqueror if you're constantly being conquered in your heart. Okay? Because there's people who live in other parts of the world who literally, literally have like little towns in, 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 in landfills. And, and these people, they'll like literally, like the Macedonians, they'll literally try to help the other people in other landfills by getting and, and any food that comes to them by sharing it with them. Like, oh my gosh, like, you know, they don't hoard it. Like, they don't even know where the next meal's coming from, but we got something today, we're going to give it to our brother today. That changes your life. So, the thing is this. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That's in Psalms 23, verse 2. And in verse 5, he says, You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy. And I see this picture, that, you know, the picture of that, that guy, I, I can't remember his parts of the Caribbean or one of those, and he's walking, and this ship is just being destroyed, and he's just walking in slow motion. You know, y'all know what I'm talking about? If you don't, I'm sorry. Anyways, but picture in your head this guy walking. He's walking down some stairs, and these cannonballs are just blasting his ship apart. Everything's exploding around him, and he's just walking. Now, granted, the movie has nothing to do with the peace of God, but I want you to see that's how the peace of God works. The difference is, if, if that's the Christian, this is why he's walking so confidently, because he knows he doesn't even need a boat. Right? Peter walked on water. You see what I'm saying? Your boat can blow up. That's fine. Take my boat. Take it all. Take my house. You know why? Because I don't need one. I can walk on water. See, the disciples, they all sat in the boat and watched Peter walk. Nothing stopped them from saying, well, call me, Lord. I won't come. You know, Peter was the only one. And that's the thing is he, he, he got, first of all, let's point out there was a storm. What happened to Peter was he was so excited it was the Lord, he got distracted from the storm and then he walked on water. But then when he walked on water, he looked back at the storm again. And he sunk. And Jesus having a little teaching moment was like, where's your faith? Because he had faith to walk on the water. And then he's like, where to go? Bubba, where to go? You had it. You were doing it. It wasn't Jesus saying you were junk. He's saying, look, I'm telling you, it's like starting an engine. If you've ever, if you've ever had to pump water before, like you kind of get, got to get the pump primed and it'll, it'll like spit and choke and do all this other stuff. Finally, when it catches, finally, when that pump catches that water, it'll just start sucking water and pushing it to another place. And that's what we're called to do with God. When you finally catch on that, it's not about you and your pitiful you and all the things you've done wrong and all the junk in your life. It's not about you. It's about him. All of a sudden you become that pump and you catch it and you begin to to bring life-giving water to the people around you. Yeah. And, and giving life-giving water, I mean, it sounds all spiritual, but it doesn't look spiritual. It's just you walking into a place caring that someone's there who's alive who might be on their way to hell. What stirs your heart? Yeah, it'd be cool to have a boat, but my question is this. If you had to choose between a boat and a person's life going to heaven, what would you choose? Just a thought. So, Here's the thing. We need to be learned to be distracted by God instead of the maybes of what might come. Okay? We need, to be, we need to learn to be distracted by God instead of the maybes that might come. Just like Moses, he's standing out there in the wilderness, and he's like, oh, dang, look, it's a burning bush. That burning bush, it's not burning up, but it's burning. What? And then the Lord spoke to him through the bush, right? And Peter, out on the boat, Man, it's a ghost. What is that? I don't know. Oh, it's, G it's Jesus. That's you? Hey, just say I can come and I'm coming. Jesus said, come on. And then you think about Mary. She was distracting, distracted from her serving, distracted from the opinion of man. She was distracted so much that she went and sat down at the feet of Jesus. Can you learn to be distracted by God from your present moment and what you're walking through? So, here's the thing. There's nothing, nothing funner than having answers 
to what you need to change. So we're going to talk about this, how to choose the good part. Because it's not always as easy, you know, stress, anxiety, busyness. It's not, it's not really that easy just to shut it off, you know, because it's there in your head, right? Because your brain thinks about it and the devil tries to bring it up, you know, and so it's, it's, it's there. So how do you get out of it? So the thing is, Jesus said this kind come out by prayer and fasting. I'm taking a long way around this. And, but, but you have to understand, Jesus didn't just run and go fast and pray in that moment to cast that devil out. He had a lifestyle of dedication and sacrifice to God. And it's that lifestyle of dedication and sacrifice to God that when it was real bad, like they got the worst demon, when it was bad, that devil just left without no problem. Okay? And so what I'm saying is that we need to have a constant lifestyle of surrender to God. And, and, and sacrifice and surrender to God doesn't mean that you're just walking around in mortal pain and sadness, having deprived yourself of all joy known to man. Because the Bible tells us to enjoy what God has blessed us with. He gave us permission in the Bible that we can enjoy the, the fruits of our labor. But there's just times, just like Mary, that you need to stop Take away the enjoyment of the stuff. Take away the anxiety. I don't have time for that right now. And go sit at the feet of the Lord. So here's just a couple, I think uh, it's four ways, four things to choose in the good part. Number one is this, faith in the promises of God. Okay? Faith in the promises of God. When you learn to have faith in what God's promised you, first of all in his word, but also through prophecies, it will change your life. But I'm not, when I say faith, I'm not talking about like, well, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it'll happen. I'm talking about it's going to happen. You believe it's going to happen so much, you pray about it, you tell other people about it, it's going to happen. Like you're willing to be embarrassed in front of the whole world because you're going to tell everybody, God's going to do this for me. That way, that way you're on the plank. Like you don't have a choice. You're going to have to jump. You know, you're going to have to get out of that boat because you've already told everybody God's going to do this. You're taking a chance on people mocking you. Now, I will say this. The Bible says don't throw your pearls to pigs. You know, so don't just share your vision with everyone. But I'm just saying that, you know, we need to get out there and verbalize what God is doing, what he said in our life. So um, faith comes by hearing the word of God. You need to get in the word, Romans 10, 17. 1 Timothy 1, 18 says, do not neglect the prophecies uh, and uh, that, that he tells Timothy, Paul, uh, Paul tells Timothy, don't neglect the prophecies that were made over you. In other words, use them to fight the good warfare. So in other words, when God speaks something to you, you go to the devil and say, hey, the Lord said this. you got to get out of my life. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Reese quoted it earlier, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not. And that's the key. Lean not on your understanding. Men, quit leaning on your freaking understanding. Just because you can logic it all out on how it's going to work and how it's not going to work, that is not faith. Do you understand? And I know some ladies do that too. But that is not faith. Okay? Faith comes from a place of knowing that God will do what he said he would do because he said he would do it. And that's all we need. Fellowship with God. That's the next one. How to choose the good port. Fellowshipping with God. Now, understand that I'm not getting into enormous amounts of detail about this. But two ways you fellowship with God. Of course, we talk with Him. But we pray. We spend time in His presence. We worship. Many times you can spend time in the Word. And these are times when you learn, you, can, you, can, you will fellowship. There will be a partaking of his presence when you do these things. Well, what does that even mean? For some of you, that doesn't make any sense. Look, let me just put it from a relationship perspective. If you have someone that you're madly in love with, they could talk about donuts or uh, flies, or they could talk about the wall paint drawing, and you don't care as long as they're speaking to you. Do you understand that God loves you? And though he knows your thoughts, the intentional choice to verbalize your heart for him matters to him. That's why he gave you a voice. And so we need to learn the importance of praying and seeking God and how much he loves to hear you. You're not, listen guys, look at your neighbor and say, I'm not broken. 
Because sometimes we think we're just broken and we're not fixable. We're like glass that cannot be patched together. And God says, no, that is not the case. Because when you are weak, he is strong. And you've got to quit living in the broken mentality because you are more than a conqueror. You have stuff inside of you that you don't even know. Peter, one day, when he was a kid playing, doing whatever, you know, Peter Jr. does, he never imagined he would walk on water. Paul, when he was younger, he never imagined that God would shine so brightly that he wouldn't be able to see for days and that he would write the whole New Testament. He didn't know that. So here's the difference of him and just another random person. He chose the good portion more frequently and it put him in a place to change the world greater than other people. You have the choice of the, of, of, of the intensity and the level that God encounters you. You have the choice. How do we know that? Because the lady with the issue of blood pushed through all the people and then she touched him and he said, who touched me? How many times did we hear that? The lady that Jesus, uh, the, the disciples said, tell this lady to be quiet. And Jesus looked at her and said, I didn't come for you. I came for the children. I can't give the children's bread to you. And then she said, that's fine. I'll just take the crumbs. And what happened? Because her faith was so great, she chose the greater portion. She got a miracle that God said she couldn't have. Why was that? Because she became that child. She became one of the children in the moment of faith right there. And it changes you. And you have to be in a place to your... Here's what it means to let go of your own understanding. You don't get to worry. You don't get to mull about it at night. You don't get to think about it. You don't get to stress over it. You don't get that. That's not yours anymore. It's God's. Well, what if it all falls apart? It's gonna, if it's going to fall apart, it's going to do it one way or the other. I'd rather it fall apart with me leaning on God than fall apart otherwise. But here's the cool thing about Jesus. He still pulled Peter up when he fell. When he sunk down in that water, he still pulled him up. So don't think that you're going to be abandoned by God because you failed. You know what I'm saying? You're not abandoned by God because you had anxiety or because you had the stress. God's still going to be there for you. I'm just giving you, the Word of God's just giving you a way that you can walk in the peace of God without having to be tormented because he looked at those people in the other crowd and he said, I see my sheep and they're harassed and they're helpless and they're distracted. And he doesn't want that for you. So this is not about, oh, you dealt with anxiety again. This is about, hey, every time it comes back, you have another chance to learn how to walk in the peace of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And what's some of the things we, we crave? Why do we do drugs? Why do we, why do we watch porn? Why do we do things we shouldn't do? Because we need desperately the peace and the joy. And we need to be right about something. And the thing is, is what we're really seeking for is the kingdom of God. And you can't have those things in the portion that you need it because all humans crave the kingdom because that's where you belong. And when you allow the cares of the world to consume your mind, even if it's just for a moment and a portion, it's blocking that from you. So, first, first is faith in the promises of God. Next is fellowship with God. Next is this, attentive to his word. He said, my sheep hear my voice in John 10, 28, uh, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice. You're his sheep. If you know Christ, you're his sheep and you hear his voice. So be listening all the time. Moses listened and there was a bush burning. Oh, heck, look at that. There's a bush burning. The worship team can go and come up if they are ready. And you think about Martha. She was attentive. I mean, Mary, she was attentive. She was just sitting there. And she realized, man, I got to go partake of his love. Because that's what she was doing. You understand that when Jesus spoke, he spoke from a place of love. And love, especially sometimes to men, can sound like unimportant. Like, oh, it's just love, you know. Let me tell you something. It is the love of God that saved all mankind. Without love, we have nothing. We're just a sounding gong. You know why the world sounds so annoying? Because they don't actually have love. They have a kind of love, but it is not the love of God. Because the love of God, it, it comes with one huge attachment, and that's God. And with God comes justice. God must have both justice and love. So, we need to be attentive to his voice. And, and lastly, we need to be obedient to God. It says this, 
John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That is my food. It's to do the will of him who sent me. See, that's the thing, that sometimes we're starving spiritually, not because we're not spending time in the word, but because we're not obeying the word we're spending time in. You know? And inside we're starving, and we just want anything to answer that. But let me tell you something. If you're really happy... Like you have a happy moment that's just beyond all happiness. Like when my kids were born, I didn't really care what happened. Whatever. You want the truck? I don't care. Take it. I got a baby. You know? Like there's a joy that, it, that, that, that happens in your life. And when you experience that joy, and that's the thing is that's what we're going for. Things aren't always just going to be beautiful and perfect in your life just because you obey God. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all right and so we have to set our hearts because i want to see god do miracles in this house like we've never seen before and i want to see souls saved like never before i want to see lives change i want to see a thousand church planted but i can tell you right now that as a house as a body if we're going to run in this together it's going to have to be from a place of total surrender to him and surrender is not just i obey all your commands it's also i trust you that you love me some of you struggle with that you don't think God loves you and you have your list this is why he has his list Jesus that's why he loves you the Bible says he so loved the world that he gave his only son see he already loves the world he didn't like what they do and so there's a part of God he's seeking you in intimacy with you why because he made you his breath is in you look this may sound strange but when god communes with you he's also communing with himself because he's in you deep christ to deep so we're just going to take a moment here and i want you to think about that have you allowed some cares some pleasures you know whether that be facebook netflix whatnot anxiety have you allowed those things to distract you from the good portions. So we're going to worship for just a minute. If we could just stand. We're just going to take just a moment here. I'm caught up in your presence. Oh, I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up
going to do is because I know that many of you right now are letting go of some things, letting go of some self-hatred. You need to do that. That's the Holy Ghost. Some anxiety, some things that distracted you. So what I want to do, and before you come down, I want you to hear this. We're going to come down to the altar in a minute. Okay? Why do you have to come down here? In the Bible, they would have altars that they would build where God encountered them. Okay? I'm not saying you can't encounter God there, but I am saying that it's an act of faith when you walk from your chair and come to the altar. So I want to encourage you this. If you deal or have dealt with anxieties, fears, worries, busyness, anything that you, if there's been anything that you put before God, even if it's small, then I want to encourage you to come down here. We're going to sing this one more time through. And I want you to sing with all your heart that there is nothing else, that you're coming to sit at his feet. Let's do that now. And I just want to give you all a minute Give us all a minute here just to re-surrender to him all over again. This is not just surrendering from sin. We need to do that. But this is, this is dealing with cares, pleasures, worries, fears, all the stuff. about to go deeper than you've ever went with him it's really just your choice who's it going to be i don't have to point you out you know why because you're pointing yourself out either you're going to be peter calling saying hey jesus if it's you call are you going to sit in the boat and watch it happen that's your decision so what are you going to do right now what are you fixing to cry out for right now what do you want you're going to be silent listen you going to cry out right now? You're going to be Peter? Come on.
right now. Thank you, Father, for your fire. Thank you for your fire. Thank you for your fire. Lord, they are crying out to you. It's time to walk on the water. It's time to do something you've been afraid to do. It's time to tell someone about Jesus. It's time to pray for someone who needs a miracle. That's what it means to walk on water. Just release that faith in Jesus' name. Faith from heaven. Thank you, Father. Now, Jesus would say this. Go and do it now. It's your time. If our prayer uh, family would come up, if you need any extra prayer, we have people here for that. And if not, you just continue to worship for a few minutes. Love you guys.